And it seems that every time I speak in reply to a budget, Barbados finds itself in the grips of some behavioral crisis every time that one opens access to social media. There is some social event that is alarming us. And while we do well with fiscal and financial statements, this country expects us to do well and to do equally well, not only with, moral, with material enfranchisements, but with moral enfranchisements. And these crises occur largely among that group of the population that we call our young people or young people. I do not wish to add to the alarm by saying that it appears to me, Your, Your Honor, as if we were in deep trouble. It appears that way to me. And if I were to say that, I hope that I will be justly accused, justifiably accused, of exaggerating. But I'm concerned. I'm concerned as a parliamentarian. I'm concerned as a, a parent. I'm concerned as a citizen of this country, that we need to safeguard the moral architecture of this country. We need to say to our young people that the future belongs to them. But we as parliamentarians, we as a government, we who call ourselves leaders, need to say to them that we will meet our responsibility to establish or to safeguard or to defend that architecture, that infrastructure, which was bequeathed to us, to our generation, and which placed us in a country which was reasonably well livable in spite of its, in spite of its imperfections. I am concerned. Now, I don't wish to visit my colleagues or this country with any view that these infractions are new. When I was at school, people were smoking. When I was at school, students were drinking. I came up in a Barbados in the 1960s and 70s as a child. And Calypso's were commodifying, objectifying, and sexualizing women, and in many cases, degrading them. That is the Barbados in which I came up. But what I perceive to be the difference today is that the immoral conduct is more visible. It is more extreme but it is certainly more public. And we ask ourselves, why is a significant portion of our young population feeling this need to publicize antisocial and deviant behavior? Why? That is the difference. That is the fundamental difference. It is as if they're saying to us, I am going to shock you. I am going to record my activity and I'm going to place it in the face of the public. And that is the difference. Are they saying to us then, Your Honor, that they're engaging in a form of social protest? And if it is protest, we must take note and we must respond. As a parliament and as a government, we must respond. And I, I, I had a, a look at the media shortly before I spoke and I discovered that the ministry officials were making statements as to some of these incidents which have been occurring. But as I've said, they occurred when I was at school. They occur now except that it is in our faces, it is public. So I join 
I join with all the voices in the hope and with the quest to return to this country to a state of some stability, to a state of some moral stability. We cannot and we must not, as parliamentarians, as leaders, present ourselves as paragons of virtue, which we are definitely not. But I repeat, as social planners and political leaders, we must establish that architecture, that infrastructure, that safeguards the interests of all young people in this country, including those who deviate from the norms, the accepted norms of behavior. I am sorry that I must say to you, Your Honor, that I have not come to comfort the disturbed. I prefer to disturb those who are comfortable in an environment in which we cannot remain comfortable. We cannot. I have been given the responsibility of leading a committee on governance in this place I was given the responsibility of chairing a commission on local governance. And we went across this country from 2019 until last year when we presented to the cabinet in text and orally or report to the government as to the need for local government in this country. Again, I say to this house, I say to this country, let that new scheme of local government be a part of the architecture, be a part of the infrastructure that will safeguard the interests of this country and that will safeguard the interests of the young people of this country if this country is to be as livable over the next 15, 20 years as it was over the last 55 years of independence. I therefore present that report to this house and commend that report to this house as a scheme that will help this country to develop. As I've said before, progressive budgets will develop us materially, but we remain in peril when we ignore moral enfranchisement. And I am concerned, Your Honor. I am deeply concerned. But there's light. There's light as they say at the end of the proverbial tunnel. I had a short conversation last night with uh, my honorable colleague who represents St. John. I think he is responsible for sports. Short conversation, but very, very productive. And I said to him, he has a great challenge on his hands. I say that because in any scheme of local government, Sport must be important. We must embrace sport and the development of sport. The world produced, or this country, produced the world's greatest cricketer of all time. And those who live for the next 50 years, I wager, will not see as great a cricketer as Sir Garfield St. Auburn Sobers. And I say this country produced him. But more particularly, beg your pardon? Cricketer. Yes, cricketer. I say this country produced him. And more particularly, the Barbados Cricket League produced him. 
from a league of 122 clubs across this country, guaranteeing to this society social stability. Don't underestimate the value and the importance of sport. Don't underestimate the value and the importance of cricket to this country. 122 clubs times 11 every Saturday were engaging themselves in wholesome, uplifting activity which gave this country its reputation. I understand they, are now, they have now dwindled to 20. And my friend and colleague, the Honorable Member for St. John, has set himself the challenge of restoration of sporting clubs. But I will tell you something about sporting clubs, Your Honor. And I'm talking local government here. Because a club formed in the 60s or the 70s was a form, albeit informal, of local government. Communities that welded themselves together around a single activity. Generally, it was sport. Sometimes it was what they call cultural activity. But it was all about social cohesion. It was about management, even of a village, even of a community, even of a parish, extending to a country. This country was managed at the local level for many, many years in a very informal way through our sports clubs, our community clubs, and what they call our cultural clubs. I support the Honorable Member for St. John if he wishes not to go back, but to go forward. And to go forward drawing on positive examples, as I said, in which 122 young men, I beg your pardon, 122 clubs of 11 men, populated the fields, the greens of this country every Saturday and Thursdays in the nets and gave this country the social stability that it had. Simple arithmetic tells me that if those clubs have dwindled to 22, where are the 100? And what are those young men doing? What is their activity on Saturdays and perhaps Sundays? Is it riding down the highway as I see it with a front wheel in the air? Recreational perhaps. But they do it on Wednesdays in heavy traffic. It's a breach of the road traffic act. We know that. But if a young man lifts that front wheel in the air, in heavy traffic. Not only is he endangering his own life, but there's some lady in a small car, I don't want to advertise anybody's vehicle, but he is exposing her to death. People panic when they see them. Again, my interpretation of that behavior is the behavior of protest. What is it that brings a man to ride down a street heavy with traffic and to lift the wheel and put us all in danger. It's a very public display of deviance. It's a very public display of unlawful behavior in contravention of the Road Traffic Act, which needs to be amended to prevent that. It needs to be made more than a misdemeanor. It needs to be made felonious. Because we, there is some young lady in her car who she cannot afford an expensive SUV like yours. And she is at risk. She is at risk. The other area that must find itself, the other agency, government agency, that must find itself associating with initiatives in local government is the arts. 
I look back with such fondness, such absolute fondness, Your Honor, at a Barbados in which I can stand here and call the names of the folk groups. I can call them. If you were in a seat, I would ask for applause for the honorable member for St. Philip. So, Country Theatre Workshop. I hope I'm not disclosing anything to this country that he wishes to remain private. But the honorable member for St. Philip South was a member of a dance group called Country Theatre Workshop. Again, another form of local organization, informal local government, which made for the stability of this country and the honorable member for St. For Michael East is sounding his voice in my direction because he wants to be included in the applause with the Israel Level Foundation. These are our local heroes, men and women who kept this society not only stable, but men and women who kept this society happy. And young people felt that they belonged to a social unit that protected them and made them into worthy citizens. What is happening now? Where is our moral compass? I know what is our moral duty. Our moral duty is that of restoration. Restoration, Your Honor. The other institution that must be embraced by a system of local government is the, edu is the institution of education. And I've had the occasion in here to say previously that education is not maths and English. Education itself extends itself. Education extends itself into a transmission of values. That is fundamentally what education is about. Education is not conducted within the four walls of a classroom. Education is an entire holistic experience, which includes the arts, and it includes sports. And the teachers in the primary schools will tell you and they have told you for many years, Your Honor, that the best students, and when I say best, I'm not talking about the ones who get in the 90s, I'm talking about human development. The best students are those who don't only read and perform their maths and their English, but they engage themselves in what we call extracurricular. And we will need to reach the point in this country and in our schools where we cease to refer to the arts and the sports as extracurricular. It must be regarded as being central to the curriculum because the sports and the arts are central to a child's development. But I haven't left the theme of the moral decline that we are seeing displayed among our young people. This is all included in the agenda to save our young people and by extension to save this country. I repeat, I have not come to comfort the disturbed. Let my words disturb those who remain comfortable in spite of what is happening in this country. But there's hope. There's hope. I heard my colleague and my friend, the Honorable Member for St. John, express hope. He used the word hope. And we all must join with him. Hope, my friend, springs from faith. Let us join with that hope, optimism. Optimism springs from the evidence. And we want some evidence that this country is willing to return us on a path 
that will save itself and will more particularly save the young people of this country. On another occasion, I will express my voice honestly, and if it must be an independent voice, so be it. I engage my conscience when I speak on matters public. And I come to this place with the virtue of courage. And if that speech places me in the minority, it matters not to me if this country, the interest of this country, is dependent even on listening to a minority view. And I beseech those with the responsibility to approach this question of the common entrance exam with some care. Yes, there are points in national life where we need to fix things. But when I was doing Latin at school, there was a phrase, festina lente, hasten slowly. There is no rush to do good. And if that rush makes us stumble upon bad, let us hasten slowly. And let us engage the views of our parents. Let us engage the views, importantly, of the other important stakeholders within the institution of education, those who sit centrally, the teachers. Education has brought this country too far. Too far! Honorable member, you have five more minutes. Five minutes. You're very kind, sir. Thank you. Education has brought this country too far. And let us develop it. And let us do so carefully. Festina lente. That is as much as I will say on that for the time being. And will add that I beg my colleagues, as we went around this country, begging the citizens of this country to find that a system of local government will rescue this country, that for too long, constitutionally and politically, governance, the systems of governance have been top heavy. And there's no reason why a man living in a community, whether it is wealthy or poor, should feel at the mercy, should feel that he must wait on the benevolence of the executive for infrastructural development to take place in his community. But not only is it about, it is about not only is it about material enfranchisements. It is about a community having a sense of responsibility, having its own sense of responsibility for its development. So that a properly functioning system of local governance will embrace the welfare system. And it will become a scheme of protection in which the local people protect their own in which indigence does not have to go on the front page of any newspaper and does not call necessarily on the kindest intervention of a minister, but that the local people, as happened in Barbados, do you understand, Your Honor, that several children who used to be homeless and were potentially homeless were housed quietly in homes across Barbados, in country and town. Several, and I quote, strangers found themselves living as brother and sister in a house down the street. And they were not related. And the rest of us who looked on, looked on curiously. 
and we weren't sure whether they were a brother, a cousin, whether there was any blood relation. The point I make to you again, Your Honor, is that this country had reached such a high point of social development that it protected its own. I appeal to my colleagues to embrace a system of local governance and local government. You lose nothing for supporting it. You gain a country. You gain a community. And it is a gain that will receive the blessing of the Almighty. There's a sense in which it is holy. We need to rescue this country morally. Good budgets will go part of the way. Will go part of the way. But if we lose that sense of compassion, if we lose that sense of being our brother's keeper, our pockets could be full, but our hearts remain empty. I thank you, Your Honor, for the time that you've given me. I feel strongly on this subject, and perhaps at some point, there will be a head brought to this parliament under which I can expand more fully. I'm obliged to you, sir. Thank you. Honorable member for St. Michael East. I, I hope, I'm surprised that my voice is so loud. Anyhow, I hope that you heard me, sir. Um, yes, sir, thank you. I might not be as eloquent as my friend um, from Christchurch, who is a, l a learned brother um, in many different areas um, of human endeavor, different disciplines. Um, but I, will, I hope that I'll be able to make sense of a few words which I intend to babble today. Um, and, and, and sir, where I go around, I will hope that my colleagues who are much wiser than I am will be able to bring me back on track. Sir, I want to be inspired by a stanza, just two verses of a stanza, as I said before, by an outstanding Caribbean man. Um, it is, it is called, this is dark there. This is a dark time, my love. Martin Carter, correct. I know you would correct me, sir. This is a dark time, my love. All around the lands, beetles, beetles crawl about. The sun, the morning sun, is hidden in the sky. And red flowers bend their heads in awful sour, sorrow. This is a dark time, my love. It's the season of oppression. Dark metal and tears is a festival of guns, the carnival of misery. Everywhere the face of men are strained and anxious. 
I, I sometimes when I reflect on the material by Martin Carter, I ask how a man that has deceased so long, that never lived in these lands, can capture all the public issues that affect our lives at this moment. I, I, I was hearing people talking about COVID. <laughs> I, I want to see, I want to talk more about what COVID has done to us. I've heard people talking about Elsa. I want to talk about what Elsa has done to us, the vicious Elsa. Because the Minister of Housing would have to respond to what are the consequences, the impact of ELSA on the society. What has happened to us as a consequence of the vicious, wicked, I, I almost say malicious, which is a, a equally as, uh, or rather synonymous with wicked, um, wicked COVID. So many children, especially poor children that need the assistance in the schools across Barbados. Two years older and now struggling to catch up. Some of them during that period, they had no iPads, no laptops, no electricity in their houses. And that's why I say that this is a dark time. Um, and that is why, why I've, I'm of the opinion that Martin Carter means so much in order for me to create the psychological construct of our reality. I know we can pick out different little things and identify them and say this constitutes a budget. And I'm not saying that anybody can capture in any holistic way all the different aspects, fundamental aspects of the things that affect our lives. No human being can get it done. There's always something that would be excluded from the assessment. But when you make the assessment, you still got to construct solutions. All of a sudden, in this society, we are hearing all types of charlatans, uninformed, unscientific, facing the vicarious nature of the trauma which they experienced during the last election, the people indicated very clearly, you are not bringing anything to the table that is worthy of our consideration. Consequence, consequence Everybody in one of those groups who thought they were of importance to the Barbadian public, every man lose his deposit at the Treasury is much fatter tonight as a consequence of these peripheral characters who thought that they had an answer. And when you believe that in the post-election period these people would have hide and reconsider the way in which they were rejected. They want to make comments every day in the newspaper about how this government is performing. And even when some of them or one of them was in here, he didn't put anything of any great significance. It is not Prescott's judgment. It's not the member of St. Michael's judgment. It's the people's judgment. You had to move from one constituency to another. And even after they do that, they could not save a deposit. It said, it said something then about the kind of confusion at the time that we are in, the kind of confusion that we're in, where people do not even know um, their place in terms of how they can contribute to the development of Barbados. And that is why I was inspired this morning to go to the text by Martin Carter. 
because it is just a period of that kind of confusion. And then they find themselves playing a, a, a role within the daily newspapers and expressing their views on radio and television. And somebody who obviously, the, in the people's mind, you don't get 30 seats on two occasions. It has never happened anywhere in the world. And the people must judge us in everything that we do. It is not an elitist core of persons who assume that they are the brains of the society that decided that we should get 30 seats. The people, the ordinary people in the street, who, as I said before, don't have shoes in some cases, don't work the way, homeless. The people say you are not worthy of representing them. I, I must give credit to the Honorable Prime Minister of Barbados. Some people might be a little surprised knowing that I have experienced things in my life that should cause me to think different. But I don't have malice in my heart. I don't have malice in my heart. If I feel that you do me wrong, I will tell you that you do me wrong. And when I get up in the morning, you are my friend if you so desire to be. Otherwise, if you don't feel like being my friend, my, 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 my purpose for being here, I am parliamentary representative of the people of St. Michael's East. I ain't nobody. I ain't walking about doing anything in order to find the favors for me to get no job, no ministry, nothing so. So anytime I say something about the Prime Minister of Barbados, I say objectively with no malice for any human being, including some people that people believe that I don't like. I, I, I have had Caucasian friends. Look, the member for St. Thomas probably is one of my, one of the, my friends that I have had for many years. But we have had one or two little, you know what it is. We are two different persons. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I don't know if the Deputy Prime Minister, I don't know if put me to sit beside her. I think I'll be very careful that I don't receive a right hook. <laughs> well, for quite a long time, she withdrew from me and our friendship. But I love you. I love you. I love you. Honestly, I love you. And I, I, and I tell you why I love you too, because I believe that you have a right to be here. Uh, even in the budget, I know that whenever you express yourself with the passion uh, that you do, I believe that it is because you are on the same track as I am on because our central purpose to participate in any debate in here is to respond to issues if we feel that the issues don't relate to the the, the level of persistent poverty that exists in this society. And minister, the minister from St. Michael's South will discover that one of the most dangerous creatures in public life that we have always been confronted with is poverty. You can't have a debate and exclude poverty. You don't want any word that is synonymous with poverty. The people in Barbados who live in poverty, they are so numb in the circumstances that they're living, they don't even know that they're still living in poverty. And poverty is persistent and it appears in this kind of economic system, it is eternal. And any time we make an analysis of an economy, as we did prior to 2008, I work, member for St. Thomas, it was 2008 when we went on a program, and I don't, I don't want to travel so far, <laughs> um, that the Prime Minister of the day 
place as a major theme, not only in the ministry of social transformation, all the other esoteric things that they were talking about, he said the eradication of poverty is central to our program, annual program. And I, I was waiting to hear that aspect of it. I admire, and, and I'm telling you this here from my heart, the, hum, the, the, the humility I admire, the, 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 all the principles that came along with all the packaging within the last budget. I don't believe that anybody else in here or outside could have done anything better. But the caveat is the element of poverty. You might talk about the reductions on gasoline, on diesel. You might talk about the effort to curtail diabetes, hypertension, all of that. But poverty is at the core of all of this that we must address. And I believe, I believe that the honorable member has a responsibility to his mother, his father from St. Michael's South, his family in Lakewood Village, the people in the point from which he sprung, right? He has a responsibility to include in this debate his passion and commitment for the eradication of poverty. You did that, and I was absent. I, was, I, was, I, I have a friend that many people in this room would refer to as, as a vagrant. Because some people use that word now as though it is musical to their ears. And I went to put him down today at St. Philip Parish Church because he's my friend. Whenever he goes there, he's my friend. They call him philosopher. Well, you saw him out there and nobody would believe who he is. He taught at Parkinson. He worked at the Caribbean Development Bank. But he had a bad break. And because of that bad break and the mental challenges which he had, he never wanted to live in a house again. So these are important things that we must look at in the society. We have men on the street, men living in poverty. When they get on the street, they might not be mentally ill, but if you stay on the street for a few days, you have to make an adaptation to the new environment that you live in so you become, you become a person who then must face the challenges that a person who lives in, in, in poverty and, and, and in those circumstances must face. And, and poverty, sir, and diabetes, I heard all the medical terminologies and, and trying to understand diabetes and what you must take after you get sick. But we have diabetics around here, people hypertens suffering with hypertension around here because of the inflections of colonial history. Not sugar, not from beet, not from any other fruit, not from any other kin but sugarcane, diabetes. We have more amputees in Barbados per capita than probably any other place in the world. People, we have the responsibility to explain to Barbadians not only what people are experience, experiencing because education is fundamental, but why they are experiencing it? What is the cause? Like when you, doc, when you go to a doctor, the doctor can only give you a prescription if he knows what is wrong, the history and the cause of the problem and, 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 and um, diagnosis. And, 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 the, and the, 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 the pharmacist on the other side will tell you he can only prescribe certain things for men if men explain to him, even though sometimes they're a bit reluctant to do so, um, what is their problem? And then he provides the remedy. The minister for the blue economy. Right. And when the minister for the blue economy puts forward 
the solution, most of the time you recognize that this is a real professional man. <laughs> but the, the <laughs> sir, but high potential. The things that we eat every day. So you had discussions. This is a prime minister. This is a prime minister that is thinking. So you had debates in here that took up 10 minutes and so on. If you should get insur uh, insurance, you must, if you should use drink insurance, if it's, a health, if it's a, for health purposes, or if it's something that you use for recreational purposes or anything so. But the evidence, the empirical evidence by the man in the street is that whenever he is experiencing the discomforts and don't feel like eating solid food or drinking certain things, he will go to the supermarket and 12 insurers 12 insurers, if he has the money to do so, because that is another aspect of poverty. Many things that we know can help us to live a normal life. We would love to have it, but we live in a raw capitalist society where everybody, try, everybody who is involved in business try to get around the business. So when we try to eradicate poverty, they try to push prosperity for themselves and their families. These are some of the things. So we can talk it every year. I, I, I went through budgets, and this was a great one, but I went through budgets. They heard many things. They can mention many things that we set about to achieve. But we never achieve it. When we were here last time, we were talking about medical marijuana, recreational marijuana, marijuana for sacramental purposes, all these kind of things. I thought that in two weeks' time we got all these things by the table. We were making some dollars coming out of Barbados. The arguments went down from the Christian community. The moralists in the society start talking about Barbados getting involved in marijuana, right? The, the whole all set of all set of collectives at different at Ross University at the next place, having discussions on this the embedding value of this plant. Men flew down here. Multi-millionaires flew down here on, 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 on planes, and we had things on social media telling us who is the next man that can own a big marijuana plantation. Boy, we were agitated, right? Everybody was thinking about this thing, and whether this is something that we should dismiss or not. And some of the men that I was talking about is drink three or four pints of alcohol, rum from Iron Seal, and Mount Gay a day. So I said, this is a strange environment that we're living in, Madam Chair. But what is important is that you don't just get up and talk. The Prime Minister did not get up and talk. The Prime Minister said, my principles are grounded in Ubuntu. And you ask, what is that? But it's an African philosophy. It is an African philosophy. It tells you that you cannot divorce economics from philosophy. So anybody coming here with a knee-jerk view of what economics is supposed to be, and you don't understand political economy or the philosophy of economics, the one that you want to apply for all is not the same. Small people, look, Marx had a view. And as much as Western propaganda might confuse the heads of people who are superficial in the area of both Western knowledge and Eastern knowledge, but philosophy as well, Marx had a view about if you have, you help those who don't. That's all it was saying. If you have, Marx preached equality. Marx preached whatever word you choose, you can call it socialism, communism. Marx preached the building of not only a communist society or a socialist society, people interchange words, but he preached about building an egalitarian state. But if we can, we can preach everything we want to preach in here, but we don't execute. I was in here recently, and I was trying to point out the manner in which the bureaucracy behaves, because I was hearing it every day in my age, in the membership room, on the streets, 
how the bureaucracy obstructs government all the time. And if they work with one government and then another one come in and attempt to reverse the policy and the feel they were participating in the construction of the first policy, the bureaucracy don't respond in a favorable way. Honorable member, I feel your passion, but you have five more minutes remaining. <laughs> but sir, I, if all you can do that to me, I got some magazines. I, I, I believe, sir, that you have with your authority, a little, an elastic. Yeah, <laughs> huh? Well, well it pop. <laughs> okay. But, but I, I was just trying to put these things. Um, there are other people. There are other people, might not always agree with the, the philosophy of certain thoughts. Um, but I believe, sir, that apart, I feel that I had to put that philosophical framework in place. But I, I also want to say, right. I don't want to make this point about my friend, but I hope that my friend from St. George, where is it, Dwight is South? Dwight is South? St. George South, take warning that he has, don't mind how massive or mammoth or astronomical the task might appear to be, he has to deliver 10 thousand houses to the people of Barbados. That is his responsibility. We only, people only respect an institution where, when the institution do things that other people believe can't be done. I, I, I've heard a very stern warning given to him, sir. 10,000 houses, prove yourself or Come and take a seat over here with Prescott. He, he got all the stars that. He produced 10,000 houses. I don't know if you can get the land. I hear the boy tell you can get the money if you take up the land by compulsory acquisition. <laughs> but he got to build 10,000 houses, or I will vocate the seat, and he will get an opportunity to sit here. Out here is representative of a symbolic uh, position. Right? Um, so although you're not part, it, it, it might may not be de jury, but it looks as though it has some de facto meaning. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, sorry for the, I'm sorry to say that about the more youthful and the more recent persons who came to power. But, but when I come over here, I feel as though I am, I am placed in, a, in, a, in an alien environment. <laughs> I have to get back into the debate. Sir, just let me make this point because I think I owe this to the people of St. Michael's East. Sir, there is a water project in the bell. It has to come up in every debate. There's a water project in the bell. I have thousands of people, and the speaker of this house also, he has thousands of people living in those pockets in a very derogatory way, in my view. People refer to them as squatters. The people that live down there, they got wells. Some might not be as deep as anything at Coral Ridge. And sometimes they got large families. It's just a little pit. I have been pleading. Not even saying it's the government for I have been pleading for decades for the development of that community. And I'm not, I'm going a little further now because after time you modify your ideas. I don't even want them to put in just waterborne toilets, then water, the utility service of light and water, or roads. But I think the government need to have about three or four urban phases of urban development where some of the houses that are constructed there, the government make it their responsibility to build, to build modern houses for them. Like any other place, I want something like London Board Towers or the ones at Kensington, with, with the place of the uh, country road. I believe that the state can take on that responsibility. Phase one, phase two, and phase three of the housing construction program for the people there. And where there is a necessity to realign the houses when you do that, 
It is something that the people will respect. If you just deal with the utility services, people can be living in the same houses of the same quality in the specific area. So I, it is going to be on the agenda until I leave here. I am not leaving so soon. So whoever, whoever got it on the agenda, like they had it before, it's a waste of time. Because when I come here, the people put me here for five years. And you can get five years of truth and represent, representation of the people of St. Michael's East. Sir, I am sorry that I spend so much time. You might even describe it as froth. Right? No, but sir. I felt that I had to give it a philosophical framework first. Right? I hope that on the next occasion, I, 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 I know I can't prejudice the chair, but I hope on the next occasion, you will be so impressed that I'm saying something of importance to your ears that you will extend, extend and give me another half hour in order to make a presentation. So I, I want to thank you for allowing me to just make that brief contribution to the debate, the national debate of Barbados, and I hope that we can fulfill all the tenets within the declaration in which the Prime Minister um, stated in her budgetary proposals. I strongly believe that this was a good budget in comparison to what we have now in our environment. There's no, there's no big set of intellectual debate on the outside or sometimes in here as well. Right? So I want to thank you, sir. I am not going to encroach on your responsibilities any further. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Honorable member for Christchurch East. Mr. Deputy Speaker, thank you so much for the opportunity to mic is on. Mr. Deputy, hello, testing. Mr. Deputy Speaker, thank you so much for the opportunity to respond and to lend my voice to this debate. Um, before I start, it being, I guess, the largest stage that um, a politician will have in the course of a year. I just want to thank the good people of Christchurch. I just want to thank the good people. The mic is on. Can you hear me clearly? Can you hear me clearly? I just want to thank the good people of Christchurch East who returned me. Um, and I continue my pledge to have your back as you had mine in the last election. Sir, Oliver Wendell Holmes, a former justice of the US Supreme Court said, and it's probably one of the most famous quotes about government, that taxes are the price we pay for a civilized society. And in some respects, sir, a civilized society is the entire purpose of government. We come here to make a difference. We come here to create and maintain order. We come here to do what is necessary for um, the persons in a country. We come here for the betterment of Barbados and we try to make our society civilized. One of the ways that we do this, sir, is that we come to the people and we explain to them what the government's plans are, how we plan to spend the money, and what we plan to do to take our country forward. And that's what we commonly refer to, sir, as the budget address. Now, I've, I've heard the criticisms that have come from the usual places following the, the Prime Minister's address on Monday. But if we are honest with ourselves, sir, the lead up to this budget the anticipation and the fear of the average Barbadian was that we were going to get laced with taxes. The average Barbadian was living in fear as to what exactly would be delivered on last Monday, how much would it impact us, and how far would it set us back. And I think the, the fears of the average Barbadian were largely unrealized by the pronouncements and the plans as espoused by the Honorable Prime Minister. So this was not a giveaway budget because this is not the time to give away. The reality is that we're in a very, very difficult time in our country's history. We're in a very difficult time globally. The economic realities are what they are. We've been through perhaps the most trying time that the country has gone through over the last three years. And we have expenses that we have to accommodate. We have programs and projects that we're trying to move forward 
but the electricity bill threatened to get cut off. So you have to balance in a budget, so it's, sim it's like balancing a household income or, or running a household on a much larger scale with a lot more implications. So this was not a giveaway budget because we could not do that. And I think Barbados as a whole realized that this was not a time for that. But neither was this a punitive budget. So it wasn't budgetary punishment. The vast majority of persons who have weighed in, the economists who were destroyed, that were destroyed in the um, hurricane and the freak storm. And this is not a case of giving away. There are people who are not in a position to replace their houses. They could not afford it. Done related to the same COVID and the same hurricane and the same freak storm. And the money has to come from somewhere. We cannot get it from people who don't have. Our tax base is probably at its lowest right now. So the logical thing, sir, was to talk to the people who, by dint of circumstance, had a windfall over this period. Sir, if we think forward to the enfranchisement of persons, I think perhaps the, the greatest positive aspect of the budget was the rooftop solar PV. People keep thinking that what happens to the person who can't afford to put PV on their house? There are a lot of companies, I can think of Binop for one, I'm calling it because it's a government company, but there are a lot of companies who are looking to lease roof space from persons. So I might not be able to afford to put PV on my house, but some, my house now becomes a leasable, my, my roof becomes a leasable commodity. I can gain a profit just from my roof space. And whereas before every single PV installation had to get permission from the Ministry of Energy. And that led to a serious backlog of applications to put up one or two PVs on your house, you had to go and get permission. This has taken away that. We said, let us enfranchise people. If your, if your roof can take it, put on the PV. You don't have to apply for it. You have to follow certain guidelines, but you can put it on. If you can't put it on, rent it to somebody who can put it on for you. And that will put money, sir, in people's pockets. Sir, the ease, well, it spoke about the ease of tax on electric vehicles. Another major initiative, and this touches on concerns of my ministry, sir, is the import duty waiver and also the and VAT and the installation on the purchase and installation of generators for residential homes. Sir, over the last few climatic events we had in Barbados, Barbadians understood what it was like to live without power, what it was like to live without electricity. And so we didn't like it. Leiden Power was able to restore, I think most houses in Barbados within seven days, the outliers were probably within two weeks. If we actually follow what happens in the rest of the world, sir, when a hurricane goes through Florida, you see months and people still don't have electricity. But Barbadians just could not contemplate, we could not deal with it, sir, for seven days, we got our grid back up and people connected in what was record time by international standards. But you would not guess it to hear from Bajans. And sir, understand, I am one of Bajans who is complaining. But the cost of generators has largely been out of the reach of most people because of the duties on the generators and even getting them put in. Now, sir, with this, with the hurricane season coming in, I know a lot of people, sir, who are going to avail themselves of it. This increases our resilience. If you have the capacity to, you're now getting an ease and an incentive that if another event happens, and they're coming with increasing frequency because of climatic change, sir, if another weather event happens, then you might be able to make yourself resilient. And having a generator does not only benefit you, sir, but if, I have, if I'm the one person in a neighborhood that has a generator. Then other people who have to store emergency supplies, sir, for example, medication that needs to be refrigerated or things like that can possibly get a little piece off of me, sir, and it works to, to serve all. But the fact is, we are now allowing people, the government is saying, we are going to give up this so that you don't have to go through what you had to go through last time. And I expect we're going to see a lot of people, especially with the hurricane season coming in, installing generators in their properties where they're in a position to do so. It might surprise people, sir, 
But the last time, when the, the hurricane hit, in one, in one, by the second day, Price Mart, Carter's, Coyman, everybody had generators was gone. You could not buy a generator in Barbados. You could not buy one. We do not need to go through that again, and this is a major initiative by government. I think the Prime Minister should be commended for her forward thinking in increasing and facilitating resilience, sir, of to, to natural disasters. Sir, government is about choices. That's the reality. One thing I've learned, government is about choices. We know government is about choices when we know we have limited fiscal space and ministers are asked to cut from their budgets. You have to choose what is important to you. You have to be able to prioritize, sir. So when people talk about the taxes that are levied or the hit that you get in one area so something else can be done, I have this to say. I would rather pay a garbage and sewage levy and never have to deal with what happened on the South Coast under the last administration. I would rather pay a garbage and sewage levy and have my garbage picked up on a schedule every week that I can plan for it to happen. That is where the money went from the garbage and sewage levy. Sir, the, and the garbage cans, thank you. Sir, the COVID levy, the COVID profits levy, must be balanced against the provision of services at Harrison Point and the polyclinics. I would rather that the businesses who profited to that extent give a little something and we're able to maintain Harrison Point and put other things in place that if COVID comes back, we're able to deal with it, that we can still provide tests for persons that the edge is taken off of the government's debt of $1 billion that it had it incurred in providing for everybody, including the principles of those companies, sir, who would have made that profit. Sir, we are still paying for Hurricane Elsa and the freak storm and the houses that have to be rebuilt. The funds to build those houses, to pay for the workers, to pay for the contractors, to pay for the, the supplies still has to be found. I would rather taxes be there than the poor people who were affected have nothing to hold on to and no way of getting their houses back. Should we reduce taxes, sir, and charge for education and health care? We have to look at what is the maximum benefit for the maximum population, sir, with the minimum of pain. So moving quickly right along to my ministry, what are our plans for this year? One of the things on the card, sir, and that we should see this year is the relocation of the girls' facility, the Government Industrial School Girls' Facility, from at Barrows in St. Lucie to at Dodds um, in St. Philip. They're going to cohabit with the, and share a space with the boys. Of course, it will be reconfigured to ensure appropriateness, but that is a cost-saving measure. We don't have to operate two facilities, two kitchens, and there's better access to medical facilities. Um, sir, in immigration, and I want to say that I would like to commend the Chief Immigration Officer, and I also want to commend the Immigration Department for turning itself around and becoming that department in government that people point at as being the example, the principal and premier example of what service in Barbados should look like. But with all they've done already, sir, they're not stopping there. This year should see the full digitization of the Immigration Department. All of the facilities and services for the Immigration Department should be online. All applications should be able to be done online, sir, and payments made online as well. That is what we're looking for in the Immigration Department. In addition, sir, you can clap for yourself. You started there. You can clap for yourself. Um, sir, this year should also see a new Citizenship Act and a new Immigration Act. And we're shifting away from the, the criteria where immigration status is dependent, sir, only on time spent in Barbados. Um, and not on what the contribution can be to our economy or, or to our national development. I have heard, I read today, sir, that someone accused our government of saying that we're, we're looking to do immigration um, by investment, sorry, citizenship by investment. Nothing could be further from the, tr from the truth. Sir, Canada, New Zealand, other countries, sir, have a points program where it is not Length of time counts for one thing. If you are descendant, a direct descendant of a Barbadian, 
then you get your status as a right. But for where we don't go by descent, right, where we're looking at somebody who has no real ties to Barbados, then it is not just that you've been here for seven years or 10 years or 15 years, right? You may get points for the amount of time that you've been here, but you can also get points for your educational background. Where do you have a skill set that the government needs as defined every single year um, where we have deficiencies, whether you have a house in Barbados, whether you're in employment, if you're looking to set up a business. So there are a lot of other criteria. I'm not going to go through all of them now, sir, but the one thing about that is it demystifies the immigration process. Everybody who's applying for immigration status now knows exactly what it is that they have to do and have to prove to get the status that they're applying for. And it is transparent, it roots out corruption, it makes people able to plan. So um, I'm looking forward to that. I've, I've been in discussion with the Attorney General on it, and we believe, sir, that we are going to be in a position to present the, both the citizenship legislation and the Immigration Act um, in good order this year, sir. I, I, will, I have learned from calling times, but I would say in good order this year. Sir, with respect to the fire service, um, we're looking at increasing the training of the fire service and getting new appliances. Uh, we're also looking at the provision of an installation fire um, station in the Six Roads area, but we are going to be in a short order bolstering the facility at the airport to allow a hub at the airport to serve um, St. Philip, St. John, and other areas of Christchurch. So you don't have to wait for um, an appliance, we call them. You don't have to wait for an appliance coming from Worthing. There'll be some closer provisioned um, in the area of the airport. Sir, the Met Office. We are developing our early warning system. Um, some would have seen recently that I was doing a tour with the Met Department. We just completed the brand new radar at Castle Grant. So whereas the radar would used to provide updates, I believe once every five minutes, you can do it once a minute, that increases our early warning capacity, uh, makes us more able to understand what is happening and give warning of weather events, um, lightning strikes. The other thing we're doing, sir, is we are aiming to have 100 stations across Barbados. If you watch the weather news, normally the, the temperature, the highest and lowest temperature, is usually taken at the airport or by Charnox. Um, when you get the measurement of the rainfall, it's usually up at the airport as well. You have few stations. So what people don't know is sometimes the bell gets very cold. Um, the bell area is perhaps the coldest area at night in Barbados. We also are tracking the constant showers, as the member for St. Thomas says, in St. Thomas. There are a lot of interesting things that are happening in Barbados that we don't know and have not been able to measure because we were not monitoring them. So with a hundred stations instead of the four stations that we had three years ago and the 42 that we have now. So we will be able to get a full picture and this allows us to predict a lot of things. It allows us to predict lightning strikes. It gives us a much better understanding of the environment in which we operate and it helps us sir, to plan for areas, predict drought patterns, predict flooding, all those sort of things, sir. And that is well in train. A lot is happening, sir, in the ministry. I am, and I also, uh, provides greater insight, sir, and information for insurance claims nationwide. Sir, I'm pelting through because I promise to end quickly. You, no, don't, do, you need to say nothing, sir. I'm about to land the plane. Sir, not everything is included in a budget. The budget sets out the government's policies. And people have asked, why is it we don't see that you plan to, to improve the parish land pavilion in the budget? People ask, why is it we don't see that you plan to put lights on the silver sands field? So domestically, the normal things that we do are going to proceed. You will not see them detailed, sir, in the macro position of government, but they're accounted for under different heads in, in different ministries. So for my constituents in Christchurch East, I want to assure you the vending kiosks that we promise are coming. You got a number of roads already. Other roads, I understand from the honorable minister, sir, for public works. The other roads are in train for us. Um, the upgrade of the playing fields is coming, sir, and the lighting of the playing fields are coming. And we are going to complete the um, creation of the community center in Says Court. Sir, I started by saying not every budget, please everybody. And government is about making choices. 
I am satisfied, sir, the Honorable Prime Minister and our government have made the choices to advance Barbados and inspire growth while acknowledging that the expenses of government have been met. I am satisfied, sir, that this budget considered the interests of all and provided the greatest benefit to the many while managing the burden on those who have to bear it. I entirely support, sir, the measures outlined by the Honorable Member for St. Michael Northeast designed to take Barbados through these very difficult times. And with that, I'm obliged, sir. Thank you. Honorable Member for City of Bridgetown. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. As I stand and make my contribution to the financial statement and budgetary proposal this evening, I, I want to say a thank you to the many members who came to me and some of the new members to welcome us to this parliament. And I, I now get my opportunity in an official way to welcome all of you back to the city of Bridgetown here at home at parliament. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And it's also on that note, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that I want to thank the good people of the city of Bridgetown, who as I pound the pavement, and I went door to door and house to house, to ask them their problems, to ask them their ideas and their solutions, and to give me the chance to lead and be the voice for them in this honorable chamber. I want to say a thank you to them once again for giving me that opportunity to do so. And I am constantly reminded of the magnitude of the moment, the magnitude of the opportunity to come to this hollow chamber to do just that each and every day, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have listened not only to my colleagues, not only to the commentators, not only read on social media, but there are a set of words that I have heard associated with this budget. Balance, boss moves, the shield, creative, fair, visionary. And for me, we all know where there's no vision, the people will perish. And where there is vision, the people will prosper. And the people of Barbados, after listening and witnessing the budgetary proposal as laid by the Honorable Prime Minister, the member, for St. Michael Northeast, I can see that we are on a pathway to prosperity. And I am happy to be part of a team that will lead the people to the promised land. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, there's a few things that I want to make sure that I can highlight. And I know the time has been shortened, but I am not bothered because a lot of the honorable members of this chamber have done a wonderful job of highlighting the things that we've been able to do. Therefore, there's no need for me to bring repetition to the debate, but I want to highlight the things that I have not heard. I want to highlight the things that I believe are missing. And as one of the newer members, I think I have a responsibility from the vantage point of which I stand to bring something new to the debate. I am concerned on, on the structure on which we propose to execute our ambitious, fair, balanced budget. And by that, when I talk about the structure, it is like the elephant in the room. It is the bureaucracy that we mention from time to time. I watched this administration, Mr. Deputy Speaker, from 2018, and I know the Honorable Prime Minister as a hard taskmaster. I know the hours that many of my colleagues have to work. I know the challenges. I know the ambitions that we set. And I believe that the, the mantra that we use to stop the bleeding, to stabilize and then grow, is a sensible one. But I think we must add an element to it, which is to not only to stop the bleeding, but to remove the knives and the blades. And the knives and the blades, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is the structure, the foundation of which we have built within this country to make sure that we can execute the programs and the projects that we have within the budget. And if we do not 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, address these things, we will be frustrated and a lot of our efforts will be futile. We will not be able to implement what we so passionately and desperately want to implement for the people of this country. So the structure is something I want to underscore. I see a glimmer of hope with the introduction of a number of contracts which allows the government some flexibility to introduce accountability in our system. One of the greatest things lacking in the system to me that I have noticed nearly 25 years, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, is the lack of accountability. And normally when I go down these roads, some people get upset. I say, you know, you get vexed and then please yourself. The problem is, is that they, they think that you're attacking everyone. So I want to take this opportunity to thank all the public officers who take home their files and do their work, who show up to work early and leave late and do work. Because some of them do that, but just walk all files on the hand. They know that trick. So I want to say that with the introduction of contracts, that at the end of the day, that we can see some form of accountability so that it will not just be a lot of fanciful fanfare and talk in this beautiful place, but that there will be the ticking of boxes and greatness to the right side of the equal sign, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir. The other thing I want to, to speak to when we talk about the army of occupation, if we use two of government's ambitious, the audacity, as the member for St. Michael South Central call it, projects, 10,000 houses, the Honourable Member, Senior Member for Infrastructure, I believe he has a list of about 35 to 55 infrastructural projects on a paper. But, but we all know the history of town and country planning. We all know the history of files in this country that go missing. We all know the structure that I am talking about. And I need these 10,000 houses because I was, I was looking through some, some old newspapers. Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I was saying to myself, the talk about getting these houses in Greenfield and Cats Castle was going on for so long, about 20 years. But I found articles from 1973. The former member, Lionel Craig, permission to call his name, sir, talking about getting the housing right in the city of Bridgetown. So Mr. Speaker, sir, if we are built on a superstructure, a army of occupation, and we cannot clear the piping of which is clogged to get the progress, we are going to be frustrated. And we may be punished too because to whom much is expected and much is given, you know the story how it goes. When the bell rings, some will be found weeping and there will be gnashing of teeth. So I, I, I am pleading with my colleagues to understand the importance of ensuring that we look at that structure in order to get these things done. For me, I know that where there is a will, there is a way. And if we don't find a way, I will have to write my political will. So as why well, I am imploring my colleagues to ensure that we get the business of the people done. Done with that. Now, Another important one for me is this budget address the cost of living in many different ways. And I want to make sure that we can highlight it and put it in a certain context. When we look at the cap on VAT on gas and diesel at 47 cents and 37 cents respectively, when we look at the cap on the freight cost charging pre-pandemic levels, when we look at the cap on the water for commercial at 180, we see measures like this from a caring administration, and sometimes what we recognize is that those who are in the commercial space will take the benefit from government, but they do not pass it on to the consumer. So the Honorable Member for St. James Central, I believe it is, has a responsibility to the people of Barbados to make sure that the, the persons who are selling, we make sure that the retail agencies and the wholesalers in this country pass on the benefits and ensure that we get the lower cost of living. If that is not done, it is an exercise in futility, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir. Those are my concerns. 
But I am excited about the renewable energy programs of this administration, the electric vehicle initiative. I, all of those also can bring significant savings, not only to our pockets, but to our environment. And that is why it is something that should be highly commended. The, uh, the initiative on the generators that the former member just spoke about too, these are things you have to ensure you know before the high wings come. Because as a country located where we are located, yes, we have been blessed and fortunate for many years. But when you pass, you miss you, as the old people will say. So these are initiatives that I am asking Barbadians to pay attention, to stay plugged in, to be part of the decision making and the policies and programs of this country. And I actually want to locate and spend some time there speaking through you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to the citizens of this country. And that is, I believe that we have to find mechanisms to ensure that the citizens of this country are plugged into what is going on here and that we are plugged into what is going on with the citizens of the country. C citizens of this country should be able to help make policy. And I'm not talking by an email that fills up quickly, but we have to find apps, mechanisms, some way that they can communicate with us and that it directly informs our policies, our programs, and our projects. That's right. it, is, it is fundamental, it is important. Because we may have these things here, and what usually happens, we have a lot of fancy things, a lot in the different files. People don't know, people don't take advantage of them. So we have to ensure that the citizens remain plugged in to us, and that we remain plugged in to them. So that is something that I want to underscore as well. For me, sir, I want to lay out a vision for my people. For my people of the city of Bridgetown, and for my people of Barbados. Now, before, I believe this was around 2004, 5, 6, where we talked about a ministry of social transformation. We had the audacity and we had the confidence to talk about the eradication of poverty the eradication of poverty. But we lost that confidence somewhere because we then went to the alleviation of poverty because it seems like we don't have the confidence in ourselves that we can eradicate poverty in Barbados by 2030. I am here to say to my colleagues that that is the direction that we should go. By 2030, we should say that we can eradicate poverty, homelessness, Hunger and pet toilets in this country once and for all. We can do it. I know, Mr. Speaker, that we can do it. But your hand, brother. But your hand. <laughs> now, why I know we can do this is because we've gone through the hardest times and the hottest fires, and yet we've achieved the greatest achievements. So therefore, with the next the coming term, Fingers crossed, toes crossed, not wood knocked on, that we may not have the challenges that we've seen for the last two years. It is very imaginable, it is very practical, it's very attainable to say that this is the direction that we can go and these are the things that we can attain. Because I am very impressed with the administration and its ability to achieve some philosophical things, some tangible things, some intangible things. What's been done with Nelson and the Republic and all these things that I came up as a very little boy in this country hearing about and never seeing the type of movement and wondering if politicians and politics was just about the talk and the earring of their mouths. But I've watched an administration in short three and a half years come to a space and be able to tick every single one of these boxes while at the same time recovering and managing from one of the worst economic stands that we would have had in 2018 and then some of the worst events leading up after that and still in a position to achieve achievement after achievement after achievement. 
run after run, hit after hit. And so that these speakers are, these are things that we must not take lightly. And this government is not a government that you will see sitting on its laurels. This government is not a government that you will see just even taking a minute to take in these things. The certificate of card, all the different things that we've been able to do. They just come par for the course. These are things that this government must understand. We must take pride in our achievements, but we must look at the day-to-day -day bread and butter issues that we can also put in our achievement list to ensure the best lives for Barbadians. For me, I have a vision of Barbados where we not only talk about giving a man a fish, and we feel good to know where we give him a fishing rod. But I think that we've come to the stage in our lives where Barbados can be seen as the greatest small island state in the world, and that we can give the people a boat now, and that we can give them vessels now, that we can make the best of our blue economy and understand that our mass around us is greater to our mass within us. And that we, 400 times I am told, by voices emanating, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir. But it, but, but it is okay to say that, but it is how now we implement and ensure that we've gone from the stage of the fish, we've gone from the stage of a fishing rod, which gives us a fish every day, We've gone from the stage of a boat to we've gone to the part where we have vessels and we have wealth creation and we can all live. We can all not just survive, but we can all thrive. That is the direction that I see. That is the vision that I see for my people, the people of Barbados. Mr. Speaker, sir, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is time that we understand that job leg growth, private sector growth, is something that all Barbadians must get a great understanding of. And when we talk about poverty, that poverty is not about money. It's not just about money. It is about a mindset. And the financial literacy that was discussed in this chamber, and the way, as I say, that we need our people to educate themselves about what it is to live what it is to thrive. Because many of them live in hardship, they're born in hardship and they die in hardship and they don't know anything else. It is time that as we lead them from in this chamber, that every man, every woman, every boy and every little girl in this country can know what it is to go to school and have what they need to learn. That they can go to bed and don't have to go to bed hungry and that people can have what they need in this country. I see this as the team of the times to deliver that. And Mr. Speaker, sir, I will end where I start. Where there is no vision, the people will perish. Where there is vision, the people will prosper. I commend the digital revolution, the training revolution, the energy revolution, and I commend this financial statement and budgetary proposal to this House. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am obliged to you. I'll say. Honorable Leader of Business. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I believe that is a very good place to um, break for dinner, and therefore I make to move the suspension of the House until 7.45 p.m. The question is that this house be suspended until 7.45 p.m. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. All against, please say no. I think that the eyes have it. This house now stands suspended until 7.45 p.m. <laughs>